Good morning. Happy Father's Day. I know it was expressed earlier, but uh, I'd like to wish you a happy Father's Day as well. Uh, as y'all know, uh, one of my big Father's Day plans, I'm sure you could guess what my big Father's Day plan is for today. I plan to watch baseball, because that's the way God intended it to be on Father's Day. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you later. But being an Atlanta Braves fan, I am f firmly committed to the idea that Hank Aaron is the legitimate home run king. Can I get an amen? I guess not. Okay. Barry Bonds is a pretender to the throne. He's not really the home run king. I don't care how many home runs he hit. Henry Hank Aaron is the greatest home run hitter of all time. Barry is just a pretender to the throne. And you know what's great about this thought? is I can have that idea, I can have that belief without really any negative repercussions on myself. I can, I can believe what I want about Hank Aaron and I can believe what I want about Barry Bonds and it really doesn't affect me. But historically speaking, backing a pretender to the throne could have devastating consequences for you, for your family, for your property, for your descendants, Countless times throughout history, there have been people, civil wars, splits in government, where a pretender to the throne occupied it, and it led to disastrous times in history. Fortunately, I don't have that much writing on my beliefs about who is the correct home run king. But it goes to show us that who we choose to be leader of our lives can has, have disastrous consequences for us. If you do not back the right person, the right leader, then I'm afraid that you may be backing a pretender that's not legitimate at all and could lead you down a destructive path. And that's what we're going to see today in Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to see why Jesus Christ is the best leader we can possibly have, why he is the better leader than any pretender, any other person we can put up in that space. And we're going to see the three qualifications for Jesus' leadership in our life. And the first one is that he is loyal. He is a loyal leader. Verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. The author of Hebrews chapter 3 is telling us that we should be trusting in Jesus. That Jesus deserves our full trust. And he says that the reason why is because we should consider him. Once we've considered Jesus, we'll know that he's the most loyal, most faithful leader we could possibly have. And this word consider has this idea of to think about, to reflect upon... But in the Greek, it has this reflexive idea. So when I go outside or when I look outside and I see a squirrel in my yard and I consider said squirrel, I think to myself, that squirrel's eating something. Oh, look, that squirrel's going up a tree. And then you know what I do? I go on about my life. The existence of that squirrel does not change anything about the way I live my life, other than maybe thinking to myself, if that squirrel gets into my wife's plants, that squirrel's probably going to die at the wife of my hand, or the hand of my wife. But this passage is telling us to consider Jesus, to reflect on him, to let our thoughts about him change the way we are, to change the way we live, the way we exist, to shape us. The preposition that comes before it tells us where to think about him all the way to the depth. We're to plumb the depths of who Jesus is. Now this is kind of vague. What am I supposed to think about Jesus? What do you want me to consider him? We have a lovely stained glass window up here. Is that what we're supposed to consider? We're supposed to look at that glass and consider the way Jesus looks, his hair, his beard? Probably not. Are we to consider Jesus' character and his action, yes, that's much more in line. Who he is and what he's done. But the passage is really gracious to us. It tells us exactly how we're supposed to consider Jesus. Verse 1, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest 
of our confession. We're to consider Jesus in these two roles that he has. He has two jobs. And these are the jobs that he's faithful to, that he's loyal to. Jobs that he accomplishes and executes perfectly. The first is the apostle. This word means to be a sent one. One who is sent by somebody else. Apostle has a lot of uh, weight in our, in our church culture. We think of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter. We don't typically use the word apostle outside of an official title like that. But anybody who is sent is an apostle. If your spouse sends you to the grocery store to pick up bananas, you are an apostle of your, of your spouse. Try it. Next time you go to the grocery store, just walk up to the cashier. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, hi, my name is Travis. I'm an apostle of Kim. I'm here to get these bananas. You might get a discount. They might be so blown away. They might be like, yeah, just take the bananas, man. And tell, tell Her Highness that, she's, that we wish her well. Bless her. Who knows? Can't hurt anything. Apostle means to be sent. And Jesus is sent by God to us. Why? Well, Jesus, again, is gracious enough to tell us exactly why he's here. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 21, we're going to just focus on 18 to 19. He stands up in a synagogue and he quotes from Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is why Jesus was sent into the world. He was sent to do these things, to function in these roles, to to have his job description laid out. He is faithful and loyal to do that. But he's also been sent as a high priest. His job is also to be a high priest. Now the apostle is his, uh, he, he is being a representative of God to us. But in the high priestly role, he is our representative before God. So it's a two-way street. The high priest's role, and we'll talk more about this as the chapters of Hebrews go on. But the high priest's role was to really do two things. It was to offer a sacrifice to God for the sins of the people and to pray on behalf of of the people before God. And Jesus is faithful to do both of these things. This is exactly what he does. Jesus' death is the permanent sacrifice that we need for our sins. No further sacrifice is neither needed. No further sacrifice is required. And at Jesus' resurrection and his ascension puts him in a position to be at the right hand of God and praying on behalf of his people. And he is loyal to do both jobs. He's faithful to do both jobs. We need a leader who is faithful. That's why Jesus is a better leader, is because he's always faithful to do what he says he will do. We want somebody. Isn't life easier? Isn't it better when people follow through on what they say they're going to do? Aren't we all just a little disillusioned with politicians who say they're going to do something and then they don't? Aren't we all just disillusioned with, with, with supervisors, perhaps, in your life that you work for, that you have worked for, that say they're going to do something and then they don't? Maybe by employees that say they're going to do something and then they don't. This happens regularly. Maybe we have a spouse or a friend or a child or a parent. Maybe one of the reasons why Father's Day is so hard for you is because you had a dad who never followed through. Maybe you are the dad that didn't follow through. It's heartbreaking. Part of that's what makes life so hard, but you can trust Jesus. We can trust Jesus to do what he says he will do. And I know this because I understand that there, we can't see what Jesus is doing for us right now. I don't, I don't get the, the heavens rolled back and we don't get to see Jesus interceding on our behalf. I wish we could. That would be both exciting and terrifying all at the same time. So we have to go on what we have seen Jesus do. And you might say, well, Travis, that was 2,000 years ago. We haven't seen Jesus do anything. There are eyewitness testimonies of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, and his ascension. The parts of the job we could see, we had evidence that he's done it. His evaluation, his, the, the, the report by his co-worker says that he did an absolutely great job. And I understand they're ancient sources, but they are no worse for ancient sources than some of the sources we have about Alexander the Great, 
Caesar, others. And you know what's interesting? In some cases, the Bible has better testimony than some of those historical figures. I believe Jesus really did what he said he will do. And because of that, I believe Jesus is doing what he says he will do. You can believe him. You can trust him. And this is how we can be led by him as well. This is what makes Jesus a better leader for us. Because in doing his two jobs, he shows us exactly what we should be doing in our lives. He's an apostle and a priest. We're to be apostles and priests working for him. We're his body, his hands, his feet. He is God's representative to us. He, uh, we are God's representative. Sorry, he's our representative before God. And we're to be the same things. As people, as human beings, as the church. But particularly as fathers. Dads. At the end of your life. When your time being a father is over. Or a grandfather is over. If your child says of you, you know what? My father always showed me who God was. And I always knew he was praying for me. Is there a better epitaph on your job as a father than that? No. That's better than blessing with wealth. That's better than setting them up for a job. That's better than than everything else you could show them. That should be the epitaph on parents, but that's also what we should be to each other. Showing other people who God is and interceding on their behalf. For your spouse, Ephesians 5, husbands, it tells us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. He was an apostle and a priest. So how do you do this? How do we be an apostle for Jesus? One who was sent, again, we look back at Luke chapter 4. This is how we live it out. Jesus came to proclaim good news. Do you proclaim good news to your family? Jesus proclaimed good news to the poor. Your children, your spouse will be poor one day. Maybe in their spirits, in their self-worth, in their personal understanding of who Jesus is. Do you speak into that? Do you encourage them? Do you seek to give them the wealth? Grandparents, do you do that? Do you give them liberty? Do you help set them free from the things that entangle them? Bad body image. Just just struggling with who they are as a person. Do you seek to set them free? It says also to recover sight for the blind. Do we help them recover the sight? When they lose sight of who Jesus is, just like we all do, are you there ready to remind them that Jesus is always there to accept them and love them back? Setting at liberty those who are oppressed, do you take away the burdens of temptation? Or do you enable them? Do you allow them to continue to pursue the things that are destructive in their lives? Do you proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? Do you bless your children? Do you bless your grandchildren, not just with possessions and material things? Do you heap affection and encouragement? Do you tell them how much you're proud of them? And how it doesn't matter what they do, you'll always love them. That is how you be someone who is sent from God to a very needy people. Some of the smallest and youngest among us in their fragile states. But you also need to be a high priest. Being a high priest is is incredibly simple, it's incredibly difficult. It's really just one thing. Pray. Pray. Pray for your kids. Pray for your grandkids. Pray for other people's kids. Pray for your spouse. Pray for the people in your household. Maybe you're like, I'm single. I don't have kids. I don't have, uh, I don't have any of that. Pray for the people in your home. You're like, well, I live alone. Okay, pray for the neighbors next door. Pray for the people on your block. Be a priest for the people where you are. Intercede for them. Do you know James, the brother of Jesus? When he died, they said that his knees were so calloused because of all the time that he spent on his knees. They said his knees were so calloused that they looked like the knees of camels, which is just a tip. I wouldn't use that as a flattering compliment, but in that condition, yeah, I suppose I would. Pray. Jesus prayed. Allow him to lead you in prayer. Jesus is faithful to do these things, and so we must as well. But it also tells us another reason why we should 
look to Jesus as a better leader. He is our lead architect. He's the lead architect. Look at verse 3. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has, more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The author begins to turn his argument towards comparing Moses and Jesus. And if you're going to argue to a group of Hebrews that somebody's a better leader, you've got to do something with Moses. Moses is the greatest leader of all time in their estimation. And it's fair. There's a legitimate argument to be made. Compare the two of them. God did so many miracles through Moses. Think about all the miracles that Moses did. He brought the greatest superpower of its day to its knees through the different plagues that we've read about in our dwell readings recently. He parted the Red Sea. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus did some healings. But did he bring Rome to its knees? No. Moses, if you want to attribute to one person... Moses wrote more of the Bible than any other singular person. Jesus wrote nothing. Nothing. He didn't put any pen to paper that we know of. I'm going to laugh if the author of Hebrews is actually Jesus. We find that out later in life. Or later when we get to heaven. Moses even wrote a psalm. Jesus didn't write any songs. Moses is amazing. But the author does something bold. He insists that Jesus is greater than Moses. He says this based on the idea that Moses was important in building the people of God, but Jesus is the one who designed the whole plan. He's the one who put Moses in the position. He's the one who gave Moses the power. He was the one speaking to Moses in the bush. He was the one. Moses was just a tool in the hands of the craftsman. He was just a human, while Jesus was the one who used the tool. Jesus is divine. He's the son of God. He's the one who puts Moses in place. So let's go back and do another comparison between Moses and Jesus. When Moses gets his commission to be an apostle, to be one sent by God to Egypt, does he seem really excited about that? Is he like, woohoo, I've been waiting for this? No, there's like a whole chapter of him being like, here's why I'm not a good choice, God. Find somebody else. It's a whole chapter. It's long, too. Not like a short chapter. Jesus willingly comes. And never argues with the Father about what he should be doing. Moses sins while performing a miracle. He speaks to a rock, to make, or he hits a rock to make water come out of it rather than just speaking to it. Jesus performs every miracle perfectly and praises the Father even though he has the power himself. Moses has to ask questions about what to do. Should we do this? Should we go here? What should we do? Jesus is like, no, nah, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. Jesus has authority. Remember, he taught like one who has authority. Moses is incredible in his faithfulness. Jesus is in a completely other league in his faithfulness. And the reason for this is because he's the designer. He's the planner. He's the builder. He's the architect. He's the one who's put it all together. In the ancient world, architect and builder were largely the same person or much more closely related. In our society, you can design a whole building for somebody and never actually see it go up. There are two different roles, but not in this case. Jesus is both the designer and the builder. And he's designed it all, he's laid it all out. And then the raw materials that he uses to build the house, to build the people of God, is his own flesh and his own blood. He's simultaneously the builder and the raw materials to make the building. Just north of here is a home designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. I know this because I googled homes in Dallas designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. You can do the same. You can find out where it is. If I were to take you there, though, and I were to tell you anything about it, you'd be like, oh, it's a nice house. That looks really nice. Like, I, I see some modern things. If you're into architecture, you might even des- figure out that, like, oh, hey, this looks like something Frank Lloyd Wright designed. But it's just a house until I tell you who designed it. And then that house becomes something else. It becomes something amazing. It becomes this piece of history. One of the greatest American architects, probably the only architect that many of us can actually name. It becomes incredibly significant. And why does it gain significance? Not because of the materials, not because of the design, but because of the name attached to it. And this is why the people of God have significance. We derive our significance, our importance, from the designer, the one who made us, the lead architect. 
But so often we get it backwards. We think things have significance and importance because we give them their importance. They matter because they matter to me. We've developed a little phrase. We like to use it a lot. We like to use this phrase called take ownership. We're going to take ownership of that. So we want employees who are going to take ownership, right? We don't like employees that just view it as a nine to five and, and go home. We want people to take ownership of it, right? When we're, when we're with our spouses, we encourage our spouses to take ownership of taking care of the kids or taking ownership of finishing those projects around the house. You got to take ownership. When we apologize, we'll say, oh, it's my fault. I'll own that. When we take responsibility for something, we'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll handle that part of the project. I'll own that one. There's nothing wrong with it. I understand what it means. It means taking responsibility, but it does show this tendency in our, in our culture to praise the idea of ownership. You know, the De uh, Declaration of Independence is life, liberty, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you know the original one said life, liberty, and property? Ownership. 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 I don't think the Bible talks much about ownership. I think it talks a lot about stewardship. Recognizing that we're the ones put in place, just like Moses, put in place to rule and reign over pieces of the creation that God has given us. Doesn't mean you can't own something. I understand business owners, ownership, stuff like that. But it does mean, it does mean that we steward this on behalf of God. We tend to think of ownership and identity. And what happens is we let the things that we own, own us. We let the things that we make, make us and shape us. We fail to realize that we're a part of the house being built. We think of ourselves as the designer. And this is what idolatry is. And you can identify it very easily in your life. And this is what leads us to the idea of confession. What do you think about when you wake up in the morning? What's the first thing in your head? What are you thinking about? What do you design your whole day around? What do you feel like you can't relax until it's finished? What keeps you up at night? These are things that own you. Jesus is the designer and the architect of your life. He's the one who owns you. He's the one who should be your thoughts when you wake up and when you go to sleep. John 15, 5 tells us that apart from Jesus, we can do absolutely nothing. We have this impression that the more we possess, the more we own, the bigger we are. But the truth of the matter is, it's not the case. The more we own, the more we possess, the more we, we, we try to take ownership of, the smaller we become. So we must confess and repent of this idolatry. But the second thing is, and this is true of general, uh, in general of parents, but fathers in particular, we need to see ourselves as a part of the household that God is making. So earlier when I said that, that dad, you're an apostle and a high priest, you were like, yeah, I know. My kids better listen to me. I've been sent by God to tell them the right way to do things. Behold, I have come. Some of you were actually planning on using this later on. I know it. And you recognize that you're a part of the house. You submit to God's rule and reign in your life. So many dads have lived by the rule. Do as I say, not as I do. Is there a more damaging phrase? I want to see. And again, that's what Chip was talking about. Chip was talking about the fact that you as a parent can say, you know what? I messed up. I messed up. Don't do that. Don't be like me in that area. It's offering an apology. What do you tell your children? Do you tell, tell your children to be sexually pure? Not to sleep with their boyfriend or girlfriend. Keep themselves pure for marriage. Are you yourself maintaining purity? What do you look at? Do you lust after other people? Do you desire your children to give you respect? but you yourself do not respect other people. How do you speak about other people in their presence? Are you critical or disrespectful? What do you tell your spouse? Do you want your spouse to be careful and wise with the finances? Do you guys fight about finances? How do you give here at the church? How are you generous here? Do you respect the Lord with your finances? Many of us, especially guys, we view ourselves as above the rules of the household. We're the ones in charge of enforcing, but we don't have to. We act like a warden in a prison rather than a father. It's hypocrisy. 
Your family culture applies to you. It doesn't mean you're a controlling person. It means that you are self-controlling. Because the one who controls everything is Jesus. And he's our Lord. And this is the last reason why he's a better leader. He is our Lord. Look at verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. This finishes the comparison between Moses and Jesus before he talks about entering God's rest, which is what we'll talk about next week. And this is where Moses shows his real faithfulness. This is just where Moses shows how amazing he is as a leader. Because what he does is, notice what it says. It says he was faithful as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. What is he talking about here? This comes from Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Moses is preaching to the Israelites and he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Skip to verse 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. That's the Lord speaking in the last two verses. Moses has himself knew there was somebody else coming after him. Someone greater. Now we know that someone greater is Jesus. Moses was just a steward over the house. He was a shepherd, a worker. He was just a part of the household, but Jesus is the owner. He's the Lord. All the parables that talk about owners of fields and vineyards, it's always God who is the owner. We're included in this house. We're a part of the complete house that Jesus built with his death and his burial and his resurrection. And so this leads us to something that we need to hold on to. We need to look at Moses and realize something about Moses. And we'll learn more about this next week. Moses never entered into the rest that God offered. He never made it to the promised land. Remember I said to you that Moses sinned when he struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And God said, because of that sin, you're going to be able to see the promised land, but you're not going to be able to lead people into the promised land. Moses was on the outside looking in. Now I want to think about this for a minute. Moses is described in one place as somebody who speaks to God face to face, a friend of God. He's one of the five, probably arguably one of the five greatest human beings to ever live. One of the most important and most significant people. His relationship with God was incredible. It was based on faith. He, like we said, wrote so much of the Old Testament. He wrote a psalm. He did miracles. And he points to somebody else. He looks to somebody else and says, there's a better one coming than me. There's somebody else I have to trust in to restore my relationship with God. There's something about us that's broken. If Moses doesn't have any hope for his own goodness, his own works to accomplish a relationship with God, to enter into God's rest, what hope do we have? You got to be better than Moses. That's the standard. Good luck. I mean, technically Moses, I guess, didn't get started really until he was 80. So, I mean, I've got about 40 more years to go before I guess I really got to get to work. But I think I'll just trust in Christ. I think I'll just look to the Lord, Jesus Christ, who died for me to make a way for all of us, even Moses, to enter into God's eternal rest, his eternal promised land. You have the benefit of looking back and seeing Jesus. Moses looked ahead in faith. If you've never given your life to Jesus, do not be like Moses standing on the edge of the promised land, looking into the eternal kingdom and being like, I'll just wait out here. Don't miss that. Trust in Jesus. It is his blood and his life and his resurrection that gets us across. Put your faith in that. The same way you put your faith in a boat carrying you across a river. It is Jesus' life that carries us across. And it tells us now that Jesus is our Lord, what do we do? We hold fast to our confidence and our boasting and our hope. To be holding fast to your confidence. Your confidence is something you hold on to even under the pressure of other people. And so this is the content of our faith. This is what we confess no matter what other people tell us. We believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. We believe he is crucified, buried, and resurrected. We believe this about him. And will not waver, will not change. And if you don't know very much about Jesus, this is why you get in a small group or a connect group or a Bible study so you can learn more about him and learn more about him with other people. 
That's how you have confidence in him. But we also have to hold fast to our hope. Our hope is not a wishful thought. And even though we look back at Jesus, we still look ahead to the hope of him returning one day to set us up in a new heaven and a new earth with resurrected bodies. Have you ever considered the fact that maybe the reason why our children waver when they, when they leave the nest in their faith and why they struggle to maintain their faith, maybe the reason is because we haven't taught them how to hope and to hope in the right things. We've taught them that salvation is just going to heaven when you die, and it's not that. It is Christ returning, giving us a new heaven and a new earth where we can flourish and build and live with him forever. It's a different hope. Maybe we've taught them to hope in the wrong things. Maybe we haven't taught them to have bold hope. You want to have a bold hope? Spend your life believing that a peasant who died 2,000 years ago is the savior of the world. That is a bold hope. And I bet you won't find anything bolder than that. And I've begun to wonder if we've wavered in our boldness. I've begun to wonder if maybe we don't aren't quite as bold as we used to be. Because as a church, we look around the world around us, it's a scary place. Newsflash, it always has been. But we look around and we get scared. And when we get scared, we tend to hold on to things tighter. And I know this. I know that we're wavering in our boldness. Because I look, again, as Rodney pointed out in the bulletin, I look at the number. Being over half a million dollars behind in our budget. That is not the characteristic of a bold church. Are we bold? I think the numbers tell us that we're wavering. Will you be bold in your faith and give? Trusting the Lord. I know the economy is uncertain. That's that confidence that we hold on to, that Jesus is going to supply us with what we need. We go to Guatemala, we go to South Texas, we do the ministry that we do here in boldness and in confidence. And that's why we don't really worry about the money. Because we know that he'll provide. But one of the ways he provides is through us. Will you let Jesus lead you? Not just with finances, that's important, but not, that's not the only thing. Will you let Jesus lead you in how you parent? And how you care for other people. Will you let him be the leader of your life? Because if you do, you will see yourself growing in faithfulness and in loyalty. You see yourself trusting in the leadership and the design of the architect. And you'll stop trying to be a pretender to the throne. And you'll let him be Lord of your life. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the way that you have blessed us immensely. May we be gracious to others. May we be apostles and priests to them and on their behalf. May we care for them. May we love them. And may we follow your leadership even to the detriment of our own selves, Lord God. May we hold on to that confidence and boldness that you've given us today. May the things we own not own us. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.